from Dublin, Ireland. He's such a nice guy, and I really want to just trash talk him. I, I can't, like, you know, he's just, he's just too nice, so. We're quite similar in terms, of, in terms of style as well, in the chess as well, quite similar. So he's almost like a mirror image of myself. Tevier would be a stronger chess rider as well. My only strategy would just be fitter and faster. I guess I want to do really well in boxing as well, so if I'm winning in the chess, I'll still go for it in the boxing. I'll probably go for speed against his power. We play quite a lot of each other. I think we know each other's openings, so I think the opening could be quite fast. So I know I think he may be playing, although I'm sure because we play quite a lot, he's going to change up. Um, I'll probably change things up as well in terms of opening. So I'm going to have, you know, no real surprises in that sense. Just just kind of motivate myself to stay ahead of him if you know, it's easier said than done. There we go, man. Jared Riley and Brian Mack, two dedicated trainers, and actually two of the nicest men one could hope to meet in and around the chess boxing world. Yeah, ab absolutely. I mean, as we can as we can see from the from the stats here, very very similar height. Uh, uh, Brian with a little bit of a, a, a weight advantage. He's also a little bit more experienced as well. I mean, would, uh, as someone who's who's uh, who's obviously fought a lot more, do you think that experience counts for a lot? I mean, cert yeah, certainly sort of under the lights in whatever scenario, mm -hmm. it does help being used to it. Um, but I think without any further ado, back to our MC Jam to introduce the fighters. Thank you, Chris and Matt. It is indeed time for our first Bout. And the first chess boxer to step into the ring has the coolest job in the world because he is a geography teacher. Yeah. And in fact, he's so cool, his attritional boxing style is inspired by his favourite type of coastal erosion. In the black corner, Jared Ripper Riley. The next fighter joining him in the ring is our overachieving child prodigy. Well, he was anyway, because he had a diploma in piano at the age of 15. He also speaks seven languages. So this really will be the bout of the perfect student versus the geography teacher. In the white corner, Brian No Slack Mac. This is Brian No Slack Mac. He's a lion who will slap your back. Come to broken and the lion attack. This is Brian, no slack mag. So, Jared's Elo, that is his chess ranking, is 1,784. He has a record of one fight, one win, and stands at 178 centimetres tall. In the black corner, weighing at 68 kilograms, Jared Ripper Riley. And standing at 177 centimetres tall with a chess boxing record of three fights, one win and two losses. He has an LO of 1,600 in the white corner, weighing at 71 kilograms. Brian No Slap Mac. Let's hear it for our fighters, Jared Riley and Brian Mac. Go. In the strangers of times, back to normality we are in the chess boxing world. The first chess boxing bout since the weekend Every before lockdown. Indeed. Many things have changed, but the 64 squares have not, Matt. Um, and as they're sitting down to take their places, what should we be looking out for in this opening phase? 
yeah, of the so game. We, so we got Brian, Brian with the um, with the white pieces. Uh, I mean, generally in, in chess, one uh, tends to uh, try and occupy the center or exert a piece control over key central squares from the off. Um, whereas with the black pieces, you might go for a slightly solid setup, or, or maybe try to mix things up a little bit. Go for an asymmetrical pawn structure, which makes things slightly more double-edged, easier for black uh, to play for from the off. There, Matt, because I think they're ready to go at, at any moment. But yes, um, it, it, it's all about sort of who can impose their will on what kind of position they want. Um, Brian looking very intense there. I think we are ready to go at any moment now. Gerard looks cool. Ah, a little <laughs> wink for the camera there. And we're off. E3, interesting. A little Nakamura favourite um, for the chess aficionados. Yeah, and no, Riley a little bit um, thrown off by that. So E3, um, popularised by a, a Swedish GM called Axel Smith. Um, he's played it a few times uh, in competitive games. Um, and I think Kramnik has gone for this kind of setup with D4 before. C4 is an interesting move here. So you can play, you can play uh, D4 now and go into a sort of Benoni structure, a tempo down. Or you can play a move like Knight F6, which he has done. And, and kept things nice and solid. Yeah. So, so that interesting first move, uh, usually White likes to move, if he's going to move a pawn, he moves it forward Ooh. by two squares. So this is basically, it's a little psychological move. It will probably transpose into something a little bit more normal, as indeed it has, but it would just just to make his opponent think a bit there. Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, black can take on d4 and take on c4 at some point and go for a pretty standard isolated queen's pawn structure, the kind of thing you might see in, um, like, a panel Botvinnik in the Karak Khan. Um, e6, an interesting move, so, ah, knight c3. So, actually, um, Carlsen has uh, played this move a3 here, threatening takes on c5 and then b4 with some quite interesting, interesting positions. I play this line a little bit. Um, as white. I kind of set myself up for a fall and I well, misassess the result and positions. I'm, I'm glad one of us knows oh, what, they're t what we're talking about here. I mean, so these, these are tricky positions to play where there are pawn captures available in the centre because it means that you constantly have to be thinking about how the position could clarify itself with those swaps that are possible. And already that clarification has happened. Yeah, and actually, Jer, uh, Jer Riley um, taking on C4 shows that he really does understand this kind of position. Like, that's a very kind of classic idea, creating this isolated queen's pawn. So one advantage the black might have is that that pawn, a um, couple of squares in front of the queen, can't be defended uh, by another pawn, and therefore it might be attacked later on, which is really, really exciting. This is one of those positions that looks kind of a little bit, you know, a bit dull, a bit positional, but actually fireworks can really come to the fore later in the game. So that isolated deep one can be a long-term weakness, but also often comes with a strength. There's usually a bit of dynamic um, possibilities that are available for the owner of the deep one. Mm -hmm. um, if he can, you know, for example, oh, he's pushed oh, it forward. D5. D5, D5, an interesting move here. So, like, I think absolutely the right plan for white here. Has he played it slightly too early? I don't know. I suppose black could have gone knight um, to e7 and to stop it entirely. And he's captured. He's captured the pawn, and we've got a change in pawn structure here. The pawns are almost symmetrical, but actually both sides have got slightly weak kings, which could lead to an interesting position. We've also gone from a scenario whereby that dark square bishop on b6, which was just biting on this pawn on d4 is now attacking the temporarily weak f2 square as well. So, you know, on the one hand, it's a fairly attritional position, but quite an interesting one as well. And the bell has gone, yeah. Fascinating opening round because they really did have the, to watch out for that transformation. Often those two sets of pawns can sit there opposite each other for quite a large period of time. Mm -hmm. What they've done is resolve that tension quite early. You've now cleared the pawns entirely out of the centre. Yeah. Um, which gives the pieces a lot of mobility, which means that this early phase, phase I think you were alluding to, can be one full of danger for, for both players. You know? it, it, it does, yeah. There is certainly a little bit of um, dangerous possibility for both sides. One thing I didn't mention, um, is the possibility of the uh, dark squared bishop going to b2 now. Uh, and that's a very, very appetising diagonal. Like, particularly if the king ends up uh, on, on g8, two squares to the left, that bishop is attacking a square that could, in the future, be a checkmate square. So a slowish start, but one that promises quite a lot for future rounds. Absolutely. Looking forward to coming back to that after the boxing. Um, both fighters are looking ready and in very good shape here, I have to say. Mm. They've clearly been spending their lockdown well um, in training.
but we would expect nothing else of these two. I feel Ronaldo Dominguez is having some last words with the fighters there, telling me he wants to see uh, some clean action. Generally, these two are gentlemen of the ring, so you wouldn't expect to see too much in the way of clinching or, or low blows. Good respect for each other as well. <laughs> Yeah, which is always really, really nice to see. It's a very close-knit community here at London Chess Boxing, and I think all of these fights are, um, are conducted in the best spirit. But my goodness, what a start. Uh, certainly high energy from it. Um, Ryan coming forward a little bit. Um, Gerard is a little bit more upright, um, so kind of emphasises a slight reach advantage. But Brian is... Brian, the more energetic there as they feel each other out to start with. Yeah, I mean, Brian's got that quite distinctive stance, hasn't he? He sort of leans ever so slightly, um, slightly back foot, I've noticed. Yes, yeah, so that's it's often not a bad idea to fight on one's back foot because it kind of keeps you away from, from your opponent. Um, we're seeing yeah, the high output that we expected here. I think Jarrett has settled into an Oh, a big oh, right. With the wow, first, he's down on the ground. First big punch, Brian is down. That was that was that was really the first big fight. That was the first big punch that Jared had landed there, and it landed flush. Brian is taking the eight count from Morallo there, checking that he's okay to continue. And oof. Yeah, now now Jared is really looking to looking to press for and that advantage, and Brian is fighting fire with fire rather than holding on. Uh, landing a big right of his own. There. But my, my observation, I mean, Joe Jer O'Reilly looks as if he, he's kind of soaking it up a bit. He doesn't look particularly flustered, and he seems pretty stable. Is that a fair assessment? I mean, he landed the classic counter shot there. So often, yeah, a, a fighter will deliberately invite pressure from his opponent, which was coming from Mac, and then seek to catch him while he's out of his own. Brian's oh, down again. Oh. Um, and this time it looks like it might be the end of the fight for Brian. Yeah, he's out. He's out cold, I think. He's back up. No, nope, he's, he's, he's up. back up. He's I back thought up. he was he was flat out there. Morales looking at him and it looks like he might be. Is he going to wave it off? No, he's, nope, carry, they're, they're he's carrying on, again. on. He's carrying on. Brian, of course, took two two early falls to the ground in his last fight uh, here against Dan well. Mayfield. Yep. Yeah. Um, so he. he, he could be said to be a little bit chinny. Um, he, he certainly tries, he's very hard, and you can see he's very good at, at kind of bringing his own offense, but he does seem to quite oh, low punch and it's down, it's down for the third time in the round. Um, and Ronaldo is again having a look at this one. He could be saved by the bell. Well, we've, got nine, we've got nine seconds left. I mean, I think. I think it, that, it could, Are they stopping for a knockdown here? I think I think I think this might be it. This could be it. Ronaldo, is Ronaldo waving it off? Well, the bell's gone. The bell has gone. I think we're going into the chest, but Ronaldo is certainly going to be having a look at this one. Yeah, cut three, uh, very closely. Three three um, heavy falls to the ground. For, for... Oh, it's a TKO. Oh goodness, a TKO. It looks think, like it's I, been called. Yeah, no, Ronaldo's sorry, called ladies, it. Ladies and gentlemen, we, we have a slightly unusual situation in that not only is, is the boxing um, the, the, the kind of the result that, that closes things out early on, but it's in round one as well. Yeah, I mean, well, let's go to Jem to announce the result of that one. So we have a winner by technical knockout. The winner is Jared Ripper Riley. It seems like the jail just had the better of it in the boxing. Brian started off very well. Um, he was certainly bringing it, but I just think um, he got landed, yeah, got caught flush by the, um, the counter punch there, mm -hmm. the, the strong right from, from Gerard. Um, and really, that's 
yeah, once 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 he'd been stung there, um, with the other ones landing on him, I think you could see that his resistance, his punch resistance, had gone there. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, you, and and you never you never like to see things ending quite so quickly, but it is part it is part of the sport. Chess can be quite unforgiving, and boxing can be interview. Uh, uh, chess boxing can be unforgiving. Yeah, in ab- its entirety, ab- absolutely. both the chess and the boxing. Um, but I think we're going to to Jem for a fighter interview. Yeah. Um, but how were you on the chess first of all before we get uh, to the knockout? Yeah, he tricked me with the move order. Yeah. Um, so I prepared so hard for two openings. So that's Bruins was so smart like that. Mm. Uh, and then I was actually his position was completely opening. So I knew uh, my game was to do that in the second round. Right. So just no. But I realised he was going to beat me. So uh, I had to throw my tricks the first round, and hopefully jar him a bit. So uh, yeah, yeah, Brian was smart of me, and then I just had to give him my strategy first round, and luckily it worked. So I planned to plan to pick my shots first. But, yeah. First yeah. Round. So, and, and coming to the boxing, I mean, you, you two have both obviously worked on your fitness a lot. It was a really fast round of boxing. Um, talk us through, what, you know, how you experienced that today. Yeah, Brian was landing some bombs. Uh, so uh, I knew he was a very strong trainer, so that's my training was all about in and out speed because I'll never be able to compete with Brian in strength. And he's such a rough fighter. So, uh, yeah, I've, I just kind of worked really hard on in and out, some really good boxing coaches. Uh, yeah, so... You know, not down to me, but the people that helped me get there. Yeah, really well done. And what have you found that's kept you motivated the most with your chess boxing over the lockdown? Oh, lockdown had nothing to do, so this is something to aim for. <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, it was either, you know, put on weight or get fit. So uh, luckily I got the call. And uh, yeah, I was really thankful for the opportunity for such an amazing event. And how have you found it without an audience? Has that made a difference? Brian is like, he plays to the audience, even as I was dancing to his uh, team soon coming out. <laughs> so like, he wins everything. Uh, so for me, I think not having an audience was slightly better because, uh, you know, Brian, as I said, performs to the audience. He wins them over. Yeah. That just gives you so much speed. Uh, so yeah, it actually worked to my behavior, uh, to my advantage. And uh, sorry if I'm mixing up my words. No, <laughs> no, don't worry. <laughs> that was a really, really fast round of boxing. <laughs> uh, really well done on your win. Um, what's next for you? Oh, yeah, so well, I think we're rounding up. So really well done on your win. Cheers. Thank you, uh, everyone. Thank you, Don Chess Boxing. Amazing. Yeah. See you All again right. soon, hopefully. <laughs> bye bye. Windsor Actuarial Consultants, supporting London chess boxing.